So welcome to A Rock in a Hard Place. Uh, this tiny little original was a fun one to do and it's going to be a great one to teach you how to do some uh, sponging techniques and how to do some dry brushing and how to really manipulate your colors to get that nice murky look. So without further ado, let's get into the studio and I'll show you how I painted this one. So the real keys to doing this little painting was really playing worms and cools off each other and playing with uh, color intensities and values to create that murky look. So the first thing I did, like all my paintings, is I'm just blocking in the board. Now this is a very small one. This piece was only eight and a half, or I'm sorry, five and a half by eight. So it's just a small little uh, miniature. And when I'm blocking in right here, I'm using a, a half inch filber. You can use a, a, a larger brush if you, if you like, but for me, I'm kind of looking to get a broken up look, especially in the lower half of the painting. So if I'm getting a little bit of a chunky look uh, to start with, that doesn't bug me at all because it's kind of going to play into my hand and help enhance my rock textures. Now for the top half of the board, I want it to be fairly smooth, but I'm not too, too worried about it because as soon as I'm done blocking in this board, I'm going to put all kinds of sponging textures onto this to create that, that muted, uh, murky look. So I'm not really concerning myself a whole heck of a lot with being too uh, nice and sharp with my uh, gradations uh, and, and many of the other paintings I do, I uh, really sponge in a nice, soft, uh, even gradation, if you will, or I'll use an airbrush to get a real nice, even gradation. But in this case, I want a little bit of chunkiness. So when you're blocking in your board, don't really worry too much about getting that nice, slick, even look. A little bit of chunkiness is actually going to help you. So with the board nicely blocked in, I'll now turn to my sponge and start applying a little bit of texture. Now to the bottom of the board, I'm going to use a uh, rougher sponge to make a lot more texture because I want to get that, uh, that really rock with algae on top of it uh, look. So I want a very textured uh, look to it. Whereas at the top of the board, I'll end up changing to a soft sponge. There you go. Just showed you a nice soft grouting sponge. And what I'm doing up here is I'm more of blotting than I am applying texture. You can see the, uh, the the bubbly texture on on the board. That kind of represents how the blotching is going to be. And now you can see that I, I I applied a kind of a lighter blue over top of the green, and I get a real kind of blotched look. And that's how you get that kind of murky water look. So. Whether you're a beginning artist or you're a um, seasoned artist, I would suggest getting a good range of sponges. I have about four different ones to give me the different textures I want. So now I'm just doing a spiel about how you can see there. It's very texturized at the bottom of the board, but it's more of a blotched at the top of the board. And uh, that's by prescription because we want to have a very algae look down at the bottom of the board, but we want a kind of a, a blotchy, murky look at the top. So changing your sponges <coughs> can really help you achieve those textures. So with my image placed on the board, and I just used a normal Prismacolor uh, PC938 white Prismacolor to transfer my uh, image. I guess it is noteworthy to say that I do have several different colors of Prismacolor to uh, do my drawings onto the board. And also when I'm drawing in my image onto the board, I put down as few lines as I need to uh, be able to paint in and block in my basic shape and form. Too many lines gets confusing and and you get frustrated and you tend to paint in the wrong areas because you got too many lines and you can't really navigate where you are. So the key to that sentence was navigate. I put down as few lines as I can and I'm only putting down the major lines that will help me, help me navigate where I am in the painting and what part or section of the shape and form I'm painting. As for the blocking in that I'm starting now, it's the same as any other painting I do. I just concern myself with the shape and form and the local colors. So you're asking what are the local colors? Well, local colors are the most predominant color of the area. So when I say a local color, it means that right now I'm painting in some whites. Well, predominantly the underbelly of that frog has kind of a beigey white look to it so that's the local color and that's the color I mix to whereas the back of his uh, the back of his back <laughs> the, the back of the frog 
is more of a um, muted brown green. So that's the local color, the generalized color of that area. Now, we'll go over top of those uh, blocked in colors after and start making all kinds of fine tuning and small minute color changes. We'll make uh, value changes, hue, intensity changes, warm, cooling changes, all those kind of things. But when I block in, what I want to do is build up the actual shape and form of the subject matter. And of course, in this case, it's the frog. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that this frog structure looks like a frog it's proportioned and that its colors are singing together when they're laid in the uh, beginning because now is the point in a painting where you want to make any kind of corrections or minor changes in color and shape and form or in perspective because it's easy to change you don't want to put these off until you start detailing and you're getting into the next stage and i see that quite a bit and that's why i bring it up as a lot of people say oh i can fix that in the next stage no i want you to start thinking of your blocking in as your foundation of the house if you do not uh, uh, block in and create a solid foundation of shape and form your house is going to fall down and the painting is the same if it's not well structured right from the beginning it is going to collapse the more you build on top of it now as i get into uh, blocking in the eyes i also wanted to bring up that i see a lot of people that go to town on the eyes right at the beginning again try to contain this urge because i i get it too don't think that i'm any different i call it superman complex you want to jump forward because you think you can leap uh, buildings in one single bound and uh, you usually get really cocky and confident when you've painted uh, a couple of really good paintings and then you think that you don't have to go through the steps of building up your shape and your structure and establishing a good value range a good tonal range and a good warm and cool range and you can just jump forward into the detail so eyes are one of those spots that I find that people really want to just start detailing right, or, right away. Why is that? Well, because we're drawn to the eyes. Why are we drawn to the eyes? Because we see through the eyes. They're the gateway to the soul, as they say. So in, uh, in painting, in advertising, in commercializing, we all learn that uh, humans were drawn to eyes before anything else. And we're also drawn to reds and yellows before anything else. Well, that's why in this painting, his eye is what will jump at us because the uh, bright yellows and the eyes plus the high contrast of having black and white right beside each other will draw us directly to the eye and that's why the head portion of this painting is where all the majority or the bulk of the visual weight will be so we have to work around that or balance it off according to the head having that much visual weight. So now start enhancing the texture on the rock here. This uh, was a uh, uh, LG covered rock that was in a pond at one of my former houses a pond that I actually really miss I used to love sitting at the uh, edge of the pond and watching the green frogs and the peepers and uh, quite a few birds would come down and bathe there was a little waterfall at the top that they used to get up on the top of that waterfall and splash around so I do miss it and eh, just reminiscing so anyways uh, I started doing a little bit of uh, detail ar around the bottom and uh, I was just doing the uh, detail in the LG just to establish a little more of a tonal values. I just wanted to see a couple of darks and uh, the uh, bright yellows and that kind of gauged where my values were in the water and now I can make sure that the values I'm going to paint in the head are more extreme. They're um, more intense. They're more vibrant. I think vibrant and intense is the two good colors to use here. And that is key. Why is it key? Well, we want to establish to people that this head is above water and the body is below. So how do we do that? Well, we take the relatively same colors that we're using uh, in, the, uh, in the frog that whose body's below water but we've increased the intensity and we've increased the saturation in those colors so they're more vibrant and vibrant is really key the head above water has to be more vibrant it's going to be more contrasting why is it contrasting well because he's wet so we're going to have those high highlights in the whites around his nose and we're going to have the deep deep saturated blacks whereas when we paint the body 
below water, you can see that the blacks are muted compared to the blacks in the head above. The uh, browns are muted and the greens are very muted. So everything is muted down so that we get that illusion of his body is below water and in a, in a murky type of water, okay? So as I start detailing the head, the things I'm really concentrating on is making sure that the color intensity is punched right up, okay? So I've said that three times now, so I guess I've pounded it into you. Now you know that we're going for color intensity here and vibrance. So you can really see it now that I've built up the, the head with uh, a lot more of the vibrant colors that, that uh, the, the head being so vibrant, it has actually made the, um, the body look murky. Whereas before we uh, painted in the head, we didn't have that in that that really murky look yet and we've gotten that murky look by putting in more intense colors and that's a good little uh, lesson for if you are having a problem with one color being let's use not bright enough well it's probably because you don't have enough darks in there and if you have uh, an area you're painting that doesn't look dull enough, it's probably because you don't have something that's more intense for it to compare to. You need that comparison. And what I mean by comparison is if you want something to be dark, you need lights in it. So there's something to compare the darks to the lights. You also need to have, uh, in this painting, to have that murky look. I have to have intense saturated colors to create that murky look and vice versa. The only reason why the head is looking really intense is because I have those downtone muted uh, colors below okay so I think that's enough on the color theory now I'll stop harping on it so another way I'm really creating that high intensity in the head too is having a strong range of values so I have deep saturated blacks and now I'm putting in the uh, little beads of highlights on his uh, head and that is worth you know pure titanium white so another way to create really high intensity is to have a strong wide range of values and our eye it, this is a very good tip for uh, young artists your eye is always going to be drawn to where the highest contrast is so right here by having the most deep um, saturated full luscious blacks right beside the most bright intense whites is drawing our head right to this area the second reason these high intense yellows that i'm putting in the eye and in the ring of him uh, breaching the the water top so remember that right here as i start building up around the eye i'm actually going to build up a lot more contrast of having uh, the black right beside the uh, entry point of the uh, light into the eye with a white spot and that's creating the highest contrast in the whole painting so if we did a little experiment right now of uh, while you're watching this video, close your eyes and open them, you'll see that your eyes instantaneously go to the frog's eye white because it's got the highest contrast and it's got the most saturation of color. So just keep that theory in mind that if you really want to draw somebody to a specific part of your painting, have that part of your painting being the highest contrast in the whole composition. So now I'll start painting the body that's below the water and I'll mute out all my colors so I get that murky look. So the first question you're probably asking is, well, how do you mute out the color? The easiest way to mute out color is to simply add in the color that's around it into the mixture. So for instance, with the uh, doing the brown of the leg of the um, the green frog here, never understood why they said green frog when they uh, they do have a very brown face. But anyways, the uh, the brown of the leg there, we're just simply putting a lot of the darker green into the brown, which makes it look dirtied and muted because it's actually taking on pro part of the properties of the color that it's laid beside. Now, another way you can mute color is either adding in a uh, white or a black. One is a tinting and one is a shadowing. And if you add both, it's a toning. And 
that's why you'll find when I paint, and ever I add in some titanium white or uh, some uh, Mars black, it's very rare that I'm just putting those colors in alone. I'll actually add in another supporting or repunching, what I call a repunching color, because whites and blacks tend to really mute and dull a color. They, they, in, all, in all honesty and all truth, I really think they suck the life right out of. Uh, color so it's very rare that I'll put those in uh, without adding another color unless the effect I'm going for is to mute it out and to take any kind of intensity and to kind of suck the chroma or the, the hue the, the real intensity out of a color and I'll just uh, put them in without putting in any kind of punch up uh, a secondary color in with them okay so another easy way to uh, mute color add white or add black Now we're going to build up this bottom area, this algae covered rock. It's really uh, just a series of layer off or layer after layer after layer, creating a little more subtle texture, a little more subtle texture. And the key to that sentence is subtle. You want to make sure that when you're trying to create that, that murky water algae covered rock look, that you're keeping your values fairly close together. And even though there's a wide value range between the bottom left corner over to the bottom right corner from both a very light to a very dark and a very warm to a very cool it's a very slow gradation from one to the other and what I'm doing is I'm trying to create this halo of light on the uh, left hand side in around the, the frog that kind of dissipates to darkness all the way around him so we, we we're kind of creating that uh, traditional oil painters technique of of creating a halo of light in the uh, the focal point of our pain, painting and kind of diffusing all of our our colors and our intensities everywhere else that we draw the viewer in to where we want and that's the frog this is a very simple painting and what this what the peel of the appeal the draw of this painting is is the uh, the uh, color the subject and the feel of a murky um, kind of diffused look so you want to paint towards that and doing very high um, sharp contrast changes uh, will do th two things one you'll lose the effect of murky water, and two, you'll start drawing just as much of attention to your algae as you would to your frog's head because you're bringing up your values to be the same intensity of values in the head, which you don't want. The head is your focal point here. Everything else in this painting around the head is the supporting cast, so keep that in mind. It's very important when you start a painting to know what your focal point is and to know what you're trying to achieve when you're painting. And what I mean by trying to achieve with your painting is, do I want a nice, easy, subtle look? Do I want a murky water look? Or what is my, my, my goal in this painting? And my goal here was to draw attention to my subject matter, my number one, my number one uh, candidate here is the frog in his head and his head peeking through or are breaching the surface of the water and that's that's the key and that's the catch of this painting so that's what I focus on and what I really brought bring the most attention to and I downtone everything around it so that when the viewer is done looking at all the nice detail in his head and starts looking at the rest of the painting there are things to discover or to discover but they're not things that jump right off the page right from the get-go and really draw any kind of attention to the viewer. They're just little tiny things that they go, oh, look at all the detail in here, but it's very subtle and it's very soft. And that is by prescription. So make sure you really know what you want to paint and where you want to bring your attention to before you start rendering your paintings. Now that being said, there is actually quite a bit of detail and that's what I'm building up here is little, uh, little layer after layer of subtle detail so that when people start uh, moving on from the fog's head and exploring the rest of the painting, there is enough there to keep them interested that they don't just say, oh yeah, it's a, it's a frog head. So uh, there are lots of little 
ups and downs and high points and low points in the LG that's below him. There's a lot of LG that's covering his leg. There's uh, little nuances and uh, color changes in his actual leg in detail that uh, bring a little bit of attention to that leg and the uh, the pattering, the the spotting or the uh, the leopard-like look of uh, the frog. So there's lots of little details that the uh, viewer can engage in but they're all done subtly enough that they don't compete with the head. So I, I think that's why I kind of came back and did a little more dictation on that, that yes, you want detail, but you just want to make sure that it's not of the intensity of the head so that the head's still drawing the attention, but don't forget about the rest of the painting. Um, I, I, I would assume you're watching my videos because you want to be a better high detail painter, which is my forte. So if you're doing a high realist painting, don't forget about the, uh, supporting area around make sure that it's uh, a little more subtle than your focal point, but don't uh, have it non-detailed. The only time I can think of that you can really get right away, uh, get totally away with not having really any kind of detail is when you're doing a portrait like you're doing that uh, that lion's head where uh, 80 to 90 percent of the board is the actual portrait and just you got a little negative space area around the uh, head that doesn't have much going in and you usually just texturize it a little bit okay and that's about the only thing or place I can think of that you could get real really away with not having uh, some supporting detail in your uh, negative space areas because that is uh, negative space is just as important as your positive space because it supports what's going on in the positive space. So a, a good example of what I'm talking about is doing this little piece of uh, this is just the beginning of a lily pad that's starting to grow. It's early in the season when I took this picture and it's just kind of barely breaching the water at the top. So I'm going to start painting it in as uh, another little added detail into the uh, painting, but I'm actually going to make sure that its intensity is nowhere near as strong as the head. I still want that little piece to breach the uh, the water and definitely give off a, uh, a same visual look of it uh, coming above the water and having little swirls around it, but I'm going to actually make the intensity just a little bit less than what it is around the frog and in a minute or two when this is uh, done being rendered I'm actually going to sit back I can remember being in the studio and painting this and I can remember that because it was only yesterday <laughs> and, um, when I was paint after I painted this little area I'm like oh there's too much uh, intensity it's it's going to uh, compete with the head so near the end of each painting I like to sit back take a good look at the painting and decide where do I need to soften things off and where do I need to bring up a little detail and one of the things that I decided when I was doing that uh, having a final look at the painting was that this little um, uh, uh, lily pad uh, bud I don't know stalk whatever you want to call it in the end was drawing just a little too much attention and kind of uh, competing with the frog a little too much so I put a wash over it so and that is a very good oh here you go there there's what I'm talking about right now I decided oh this is way too intense so I've actually taken the black watercolor at the there the, the dark watercolor and added a wash and now you can see that you can tell that it's breaching but I've down the uh, intensity uh, of the uh, the swirls around the water to be much less than what's around the head so the head is still drawing the major attention okay and the last little thing I like to do in my paintings is go around and put what I call pink colors in and you were just seeing I was putting in little shots of pure orange and I've put some little shots of uh, pure yellow into the LG and I also went through the frog and I put in little little washes of uh, some burnt umbers and uh, some uh, uh, raw siennas just to give him a little bit of life too okay so here's the final piece and i'm calling it a rock in a hard place i really like doing these little tiny ones uh, i'll do a lot of them because they're kind of little testers for bigger paintings if i have an idea and sometimes i'm not quite sure about the idea what i'll do is a little uh, uh, a miniature 
and uh, work out some colors, work out some composition. And if it works well, then uh, I might do a bigger one. So this little one, I doubt I'll do a bigger one because I do quite a bit of frogs. Everybody loves frogs. So I probably do uh, at least one a year to uh, have in my uh, gallery show at the end of the year in October. But uh, I like doing little ones to work out little compositions, to work out colors. And the one thing I learned about this piece right now is that I absolutely love the color. So you will probably see a larger, more substantial original in, uh, coming down the line that has a very similar color scheme. So as always, thanks for coming by. I hope you learned lots today and be good to each other. Stay safe and happy painting.